Our guest spot for Unit 2 is Dr. Liz Bradley, who is Professor of Computer Science and also of um, Electrical and Computer Engineering at University of Colorado Boulder. She's a long-term external faculty member at the Santa Fe Institute. And her research is on nonlinear dynamics and artificial intelligence and some combinations of the two. So Liz, um, I have a couple of questions for you. In our course, we've been learning a little bit about nonlinear dynamics and chaos. And um, I wanted to get your take on a couple of things. So first, could, could you give an example of how you've used tools from nonlinear dynamics and um, chaos in your own research to help understand complex systems? Sure, Melanie. Um, one of the systems that we use, that most of us use the most frequently, and never think about being nonlinear or dynamical, let alone chaotic, is a computer. So you guys are all using computers right now to watch these lectures. Inside the computer that you're using is um, are a whole bunch of transistors and other kinds of things like that, most of which are nonlinear. And they're certainly dynamical because uh, the computer is not just sitting there completely static. So things in that computer are moving around. There's electrons moving around through metal and silicon. And it is a nonlinear dynamical system. Now, um, computers um, many years ago were very simple and very predictable in the sense that the designers would do something and it would have the desired effect. But that stopped about 10 years ago. And <clears throat> the, um, the systems got to be so complicated that, or complex, I guess, that the um, uh, a, des a design innovation that was obviously going to work, quote unquote, uh, had bad effects and they had to recall a whole bunch of chips and that's very expensive. So we got interested in trying to think about that and came up with that notion that, well, a computer is a nonlinear dynamical system, which was kind of a heresy in the computer performance community because they think of them as, um, well, they think of them as, model them with stochastic processes. They think of them as random systems. And the mathematics that they use to model them implicitly makes the assumption of linearity and time invariance. And the system is neither linear nor time invariant. What's inside them changes over time. We thought about this, decided that it would be a good idea to use the tools from nonlinear dynamics to understand computers. And we did that. Um, it worked out quite well. We were able to show that, for example, the Lyapunov exponent, have your students had that yet? Uh, no. Okay, so the rate at which sensitive, at which small perturbations grow, the sensitive, the, the Lyapunov exponent is a um, a quantity that parametrizes sensitive dependence on initial conditions, and a large, a positive Lyapunov exponent means that small changes uh, grow. We were able to measure the Lyapunov exponent of computer programs running on computer hardware, and show that, for example, you run the same program on two different computers. On one, the performance is chaotic, and on the other, the performance is periodic. Now, this is not to say that the results are chaotic. You get the same results each time. It's the performance. So for those of you who know more about computers, the, um, the way that the computer is using its memory, the way that the computer is using its processing units changes um, depending on the way that they're built. And for those of you who are engineers, that's pretty obvious, but no one's ever really thought about it using the tools of nonlinear dynamics, and that really helped, I think, the community um, come to a better understanding. Now, there is another problem, though, going back to that word heresy. The people in this community, again, are used to using these linear time invariant tools, which are easy to use. That's a good reason to use them. They're easy. But if the system that you're wanting to analyze is not amenable to that kind of analysis, it's much more complicated, then what we found ourselves well, we found ourselves in the position of coming into another community and saying, "What you're doing is wrong," which is never welcome. And um, more, moreover, the mathematics that we are offering you is very hard to learn and doesn't always work. So it hasn't been uh, able. We haven't been able to clone that work into the computer systems community literature as much as I wanted. So but that's you, a so problem with doing work at the divide between fields. Yeah, so, so do you see, um, when you say that the memory usage, for instance, is chaotic, you mean that specifically it's 
sensitive to initial conditions. Yes. That. And if you run the program twice and you watch a time series plot of how busy the memory is over the course of time, mm -hmm. it'll look very, very different from run to run. And what changes in the initial conditions? Oh, it's, you know, if you think about a computer, the state variables of a computer are the contents of every register in the computer, every memory location. And um, there are other things going on in your computer. So uh, right now, as you're watching this, this lecture, you're probably, you have a browser running, but you probably have other, other stuff running too, and some applications in the background that are changing some of those memory locations. And so those are the small changes. Okay. But the butterflies. And were you able to prove that it was that what you're seeing is chaotic? Oh yes, absolutely. Okay, and how do you do that? Uh, we well, we measured the Lyapunov exponent. We calculated it from time series data, and it was positive. And then we did all sorts of other what you know when lawyers do what they call due diligence. You got to pound on your case from all directions to make sure that it's airtight. We did the equivalent of that with nonlinear dynamics. So I actually believe the results. Okay. And, and but there's no proof. There's no proof in chaos at all. This is experimental data. Maybe as soon as we quit looking, it went periodic. In, in, in our class, we looked at the logistic map and we saw a period doubling route to chaos. Do you see something like that in your data? We have not explored the bifurcations. It's hard enough just to characterize the thing when it's, when it's at one parameter value. But um, to draw the parallel, uh, the bifurcation parameter for us is the code. So if you change the code, you run a different application, that's what causes the bifurcations. Mm. So if we have an Intel Core 7 blah blah blah, and we run one program, it's periodic, we run another program, it's chaotic. The bifurcation parameter is the code that you're running and the hardware that you're running it on. But there's no way to think about changing it smoothly, like you can change the R of a logistic max smoothly. Mm, right. That's because, interesting. Yeah, it's very different. Okay. Well, let me um, switch to another question, which is, um, what do you think of as the exciting current directions for the field of dynamics? What are the open questions? There's lots, but one of the really interesting ones lately has been um, understanding the formation and role of, or of what are called Lagrangian coherent structures. So. Um, Tom Peacock at MIT works on these, and he says, that here's the analogy he used to, to describe them. Um, imagine a crowd at a railway station. Some people will be arriving, and some will be leaving. And they're kind of going back and forth in between different platforms. The result is chaos, but there's structure. So there's kind of, you know, um, if you had a stop-action photograph of the Tokyo subway, you would see this buildup of people, and then they'd all leave. Mm -hmm. So there's a shifting, it's an emergent thing, it's a shifting pattern of borders between groups of people and the people with different goals. And those borders, those borders of the groups of people are what are called Lagrangian coherent structures. Mm -hmm. um, and he says they're intangible, they're immaterial, they would be undetectable if the passengers stopped moving, but they are real enough to be treated mathematically. And... and Go ahead. Sorry, could, could understanding this uh, uh, affect any, any policies about the Yes, way? absolutely. For example, Tom has done some work on, um, and others have done work on Lagrangian coherent structures in Monterey Bay. And if these things are boundaries between groups of stuff flowing around, with that they have implications for um, the movement of pollutants. So a Lagrangian coherent structure is a ridge that separates two different parts of water in Monterey Bay, and pollutants can't cross it. And they're, some of them are beautiful. Tom was down in Australia looking at something called the Morning Glory Cloud, which I highly recommend that you Google if you've never seen it. It's this gorgeous Lagrangian coherent structure that forms in the clouds um, over, I think, in the middle of Australia someplace. Wow. Very yeah. interesting. A complex system is a system with lots of state variables, and they're coupled, or else things would be pretty boring. Mm -hmm. Often they're coupled nonlinearly. Sometimes they're coupled adaptively. That is, the way that they're coupled changes over time. Um, and that's kind of the setup. And then the thing that makes them at least interesting to me is, because you could certainly have that everything's going off in all directions and everything's random. But the thing that really is interesting to me, and what I think a lot of complexity scientists um, what turns them on 
is that when the behavior of such a thing only occupies a subset of the state space, okay? Mm -hmm. So we call that emergence, for example. We could call that dimensional reduction. So you imagine you have, again, going back to the computer, it has 10 to the ninth state variables or something like that, some tremendous number of state variables. But it um, does not kind of travel around in that 10 to ninth dimensional space. What we found is it only travels around in about a 12-dimensional subspace of that. Hmm. And that's kind of amazing. The same thing happens if you think about bird flocking. You can think about it that way. Each bird could be anywhere, but they don't do that. They travel around together. So there's some dimensions, there's some information that's gone. They've, they've, they've kind of packed together. And uh, if you measured, if you did an information theory kind of thing, I don't know if you're going to do that in your course. We are, one. yeah. Okay, so the Shannon information, if you think about um, the information in the system is how much, you know, what you need to know to specify what's going on. And if each bird could be anywhere, you would need more information to specify where the flock was than if they're all kind of in a V. Mm -hmm. There's an information theoretic way to think about this too. So all of that is, is part and parcel of what I think of as complexity.